Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to talk about a recent nature publication that has come out from the David Sinclair Lab, whereby they show that neurons in the eyes of mice can be reprogrammed to a more youthful state in which they reacquire the ability to regenerate and restore vision. So in this video we'll take a look at this data and discuss how cellular reprogramming may be able to reverse different hallmarks of aging by reversing, or reprogramming in this case, epigenetic marks. And so we'll go into some detail about these reprogramming factors and discuss potential mechanisms as to how they might be acting in a cell to be able to mediate this reversal of epigenetic marks. So I first learned about this study when I read David Sinclair's book Lifespan, which is where we shall begin with this video. And so if you haven't read his book or watched my amazing summary video on it, then you first need to understand that David explains the aging process by using Claude Shannon's mathematical theory of communication, whereby David states that aging is simply loss of information. And so he considers this a universal mechanism to understand the aging process that kind of can be considered on top of all of the individual different hallmarks of aging. And so if aging is loss of information, what is this information? Well, there are two ways that information can be transmitted. There's digital and there's analog. A key difference between them is that analog is continuous whilst digital information is discrete. And so the problem this raises for analog information is that it can accumulate noise. And so how does this relate to information within our own bodies? Well, David makes the point that we have both analog and digital information within ourselves, our genetic code being the digital information and the epigenetic code being the analog information within ourselves. And so epigenetics refers to marks literally on top of the genetic code that consists of either DNA methylation marks or a variety of other marks that can be added to proteins associated with DNA. And they can alter which genes are expressed within a cell and how DNA is compacted within the nucleus. Another way of thinking about it is to use the analogy of a DVD, whereby the genetic code is like the information in the DVD that encodes the film whilst the analogue information would be on the surface of the DVD and the surface can get scratched and that scratching, that noise accumulation in the analogue information can impact the reading of the DVD. So in the case of a cell, the accumulation of noise within the epigenetic marks impacts the reading of the genetic code and David suggests that that is a key component that could potentially explain the ageing process. And so if ageing is simply loss of information, then to be able to prevent or to even reverse aging, the key question is how can we recover that lost information? And that's when the analogy to Claude Shannon's mathematical theory of communication comes in handy. So in Shannon's theory, he describes a correction system whereby there's an observer that can record the original data before the signal is lost. There is then the original correction data and then there's a correcting device that can restore the original signal and circumvent the accumulation of noise within the signal. So to quote David Sinclair in Lifespan, to end aging as we know it, we need to find three more things that Shannon knew were essential for a signal to be restored, even if it is obscured by noise. So the key point that David is trying to make is that if we can identify the biological components that make up these three correction device components, then that gives us a better insight into how we can restore the loss of information that occurs during aging. And so the big question is, what are these biological parts? Now, the reason I went into so much detail here is that we'll come back to this model at the end of the video. Plus, I think it's just a useful way of being able to understand the aging process as it provides a simple framework to explain what is quite a complicated topic. So going back to epigenetics, more evidence supporting the role of epigenetic changes during the aging process comes from many studies now that have calibrated so-called molecular clocks that can actually measure biological age. But what we want to be able to do here is actually be able to alter these marks and restore it to a more youthful state, i.e. being able to find the biological correcting device. And as stated in Lifespan, David says, I believe we may have finally found the biological correcting device. So what is it? Well, it looks like the answer may come from a landmark study that was done in 2006 by the Japanese stem cell researcher Shinya Yamanaka, who identified four different genes that could reprogram somatic cells 
to become pluripotent stem cells. In other words, taking a cell that's already been differentiated, which basically means a cell that is specialised to do a particular role. For example, skin cells are very much different to liver cells, which are also very different to neurons when you're in your brain. And convert them back to so-called pluripotent stem cells. And as suggested by the name, pluripotent refers to the potency, the potential of a cell to become multiple pluri different cell types. So these four different genes, now referred to as the four Yamanaka factors, are ALT4, SOX2, KLF4 and MYC, or OSKM, and all of them are transcription factors. So they are proteins that can regulate the expression of different genes within a cell. And it's also been found that the process that can reprogram these somatic cells back to pluripotent stem cells involves erasing the cellular identity and resetting the DNA methylation age. Now, this sounds great. Fantastic. It's exactly what we want, you know, get rid of those epigenetic marks that are causing all this noise, going back to that nice, clean, original state. However, going back to pluripotent stem cells may be a step too far because pluripotent stem cells like to replicate a lot. And so what's been seen is that expressing all four factors in mice can often induce so-called teratomas. Teratomas are pretty grisly tumours that consist of several types of tissue, including hair, muscle and bone. So this isn't something that you want. Nonetheless, in a 2016 study conducted by researchers at the Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Barcelona, and at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in San Diego. They expressed these four factors in a premature ageing mouse breed, and they found that not only did the mice remain young compared to their untreated siblings, but they also lived 40% longer. Nonetheless, this only worked when they expressed the Yamanaka factors for just two days a week throughout the entire lifespan. When they expressed it for longer, the mice died. And so this is when we come back to the David Sinclair lab, where he explains in Lifespan that one day in 2016, one of his graduate students, Yuan Cheng Lu, came into his office saying that he was close to quitting whilst trying to reverse the age of cells without turning them into tumour cells. And as a final effort, they decided to leave out the CMYC gene that was likely the cause of the teratomas, given that MYC is a common gene associated with tumour development. And so that left them with just the three genes, ALT4, SOX2 and KLF4. And when they infected these genes into both young and also old mice, they found that after 10 to 18 months of continuous expression of these three genes, they never saw an increase in tumour incidence or any negative effects on overall health due to the expression of these genes, suggesting that, as was previously thought, without MYC, just the three genes seems relatively safe to be expressed into the mice. But instead of waiting for another year to see if the mice lived longer with these three genes being expressed, Yuan Cheng suggested he used a mouse's optic nerve as a way to test age reversal and rejuvenation. David was sceptical at first, but then they agreed that you might as well go big or go home. And the reason that he was sceptical is because in mammals, one of the first systems to lose regenerative potential is the central nervous system. And this includes the optic nerves and the nerves of the spinal cord, and they've been shown to never grow back, as the capacity to regenerate is lost within a few days after birth. So they initially started with young mice, and they delivered the three genes into the retina of the mice. They then performed an optic nerve crush injury study, whereby they damaged the cells, and then they analysed the optic nerves two weeks later, with or without the genes being expressed. As you can see in this figure here, when they actually induced the expression of these genes, remarkably they saw regeneration and sprouting of these axon fibres extending around 5 millimetres. When these genes weren't expressed, they didn't see any regenerative or survival effects. So as they hypothesised, they thought that changes within the epigenetic marks could be the key mechanism behind this regenerative potential. So interestingly, when they assessed the DNA methylation age, of these retinal cells, they found that after injury, only the cells that were also expressing these three genes, OCT4, SOX2 and KLF4, showed a reduction in the DNA methylation age compared to cells that weren't expressing these genes, which showed an increase in their DNA methylation age after injury. 
So maybe unsurprisingly then, they went on to show that active DNA demethylation is necessary, but not sufficient by itself, to be able to induce this regenerative potential following expression of these three genes. And they did this by knocking down the expression of DNA demethylases TET1 or TET2. But so far, they've only used quite young mice. Later on, they were interested in seeing whether or not OSK induction could restore the DNA methylation age of older mice, in addition to being able to restore youthful fission and a younger transcriptome signature. So to test this, they treated 3 and 11 month old mice with the three genes and induced expression for four weeks. They then analysed the optomotor response and they also looked at the transcriptomics. As you can see in this figure here, older mice that were induced to express the three genes showed an improvement in their optomotor activity. And if you look at these heat maps, which shows the RNA sequencing results whereby they looked at the different genes being expressed, they found that the profile of the old mice treated with expression of these three genes more closely matched the young expression profile. To be a bit more specific, there was around 464 genes that were altered during ageing and around 90% of these genes were restored to the youthful levels by the OSK treatment. So in other words, it looks like this OSK treatment restored fission in regular old mice. And this is by no means just a throwaway sentence, because if adult cells in the body can be reprogrammed to regain a youthful epigenome, it suggests that the information to be young cannot all be lost, suggesting that there are biological equivalents to Claude Shannon's correction device, and also suggesting that these Yamanaka factors, these three genes, are able to somehow access this correction data to mediate the resetting of the epigenome that's seen in these experiments. And the working model that the authors hypothesise is that in the presence of these three factors, a complex is able to recruit these TET enzymes, these DNA demethylases, to specific sites in the genome and induce active demethylation. However, they also state that there's likely to be other factors involved in this process as well, since the TET enzymes were necessary but not sufficient to induce the reprogramming. So more work is definitely still needed to identify these factors, along with understanding how cells encode and store this useful epigenetic information. However, I suppose another interesting question is, this study was done in mice, what potential does this have for humans? Well, whilst in this study, they did also show that axon regeneration occurred in human neurons in culture, there are a lot of questions that still need to be addressed before further experiments on humans. For example, can all of the components be delivered safely to the right cells? Will it eventually cause cancer? Can the genes be expressed for only a short time period and then switched off again to let the cells rest? Will it work better in some tissues than other? And could it be given to middle-aged people before they become sick, the same way we take statins to keep cholesterol in check to prevent heart disease? Nonetheless, according to this article, Harvard have licensed the technology to Boston company Life Biosciences which Sinclair says is carrying out preclinical safety assessments with a few to developing it for use in people. So all in all, I think there's great promise and potential for cellular reprogramming, but I think it will take some time to properly assess how safe it is to use and the impacts of long-term expression, in particular due to the risks associated with tumorigenesis. Nonetheless, I found this study eye-opening and I will definitely be keeping my eyes peeled for any further developments in this area of cellular reprogramming. So I'm sure other people probably have thoughts, so please leave any ideas, uh, discussion points in the comments below, and I'll try and reply to as many as possible. And as a reminder, using the discount code SHIKI, you can get 10% off of products at do not age.org, which is where I get my NMN from. Anyway, as always, I hope you've learned something in this video, and thanks for listening.